All right. We are here with Jonathan Hanno, composer, pianist, amazing individual. Um, and we're actually in your space. Yeah, we're back at my home. Thanks again for, for coming over. Next time we do this, we'll find a, another location. <laughs> I'm getting used to the setup now. We got yeah, no, this is yeah, yeah. It's a little different than last time. You get a better view of the piano. That's the thing. It's like that's the golden shot. And then you asked if I wanted it up. What what is this called right here? This is the the soundboard. So when you lift it up, it just okay. makes it louder. That's it. So when it's down, it kind of mutes the all the stuff coming, like when the strings are vibrating and everything when you hit yeah. the piano. If the board is down, then everything is not muffled, but the sound won't like go everywhere. This ensures that the sound goes directly into like an audience. So like when you angle oh. it this way, then the, the everything bounces off the board and goes into like an audience hall. And that's why that's why we lift the that's why we lift the board. Well, I think uh, aesthetically, it just looks and, better. Yeah, it looks better. Say. It also just, I mean, like, it, regardless, it sounds great no matter what. <laughs> Do you ever get this? So we're recording in your neighborhood. This is Edgewater. Mm -hmm. So we're in Edgewater, and I'm walking to your place. I got a Americano from the cafe. Just like, Oh, yeah, I love Rivers and Roads. It's a, like it's a five steps away from your apartment. Rivers and Roads, coffee. And as I'm walking, it's like I don't even need an address. I just hear the piano playing. And I'm like, oh, there it is. It's not that building. It's that building. <laughs> I'm glad. Yeah, I was practicing. I was like, he's going to know where I am. He'll find it if he loses it. Yeah. Do you ever – so my question would be, do you ever get compliments from people? On the street? Or yeah. just like – yeah, I have. There's a few people in the neighborhood because – well, because we I have – dog so i go on walks a lot and um, there are yeah. some people that i regularly see now they're always be like are you the piano that's like happening all the way at that corner i'm like yes and i'm like what did you it's not even that the compliments happens it's more i'm like what did you hear <laughs> because i do so much uh music stylistically and i specialize mostly in contemporary modern classical which tends to be a little bit more discordant we could say <laughs> It's a See, little rough around the edges. Someone, uh, like who's coming up to your, uh, coming up to you on the street, mm -hmm. or me, I don't know all the terminology. I just <laughs> know like that guy knows how to play the piano. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, they they are always like you. You sound amazing. like they they do give compliments and they're always very kind. But I'm always just like, what did you hear? Because sometimes it sounds really really uh, aggressive, or sometimes I'll be like, I'm I need a break. And I'll be like, I'm going to play some Chopin and I'm going to play some Bach and some Debussy and like have some nice stuff for me to play that I enjoy doing. Not that I don't enjoy the other stuff, but, you know, it's like a, you need to like clear out the ears sometimes. Really. Like I need just something else that's like harmonically pleasing. <laughs> so I, I recently went to two of your shows. One was at Constellation last week. Mm hmm. And then there was another one in in like an art studio in the West. Yes, Fulton Street Collective. Fulton Street. So what are both were amazing, by the way. Thank you. Different. Both very are very different. different. Right? <laughs> but uh, so one, so one in the uh, the Fulton Street. Is it Fulton Market Street? It's Fulton Street Collective. Fulton Street Collective. It's a great little art gallery slash music super venue. cool yeah love yeah. that place so jonathan's playing piano meanwhile a ballet dancer is painting painting <laughs> with her painting feet. with her feet and she's dipping her toes in a different paints like purples and blues and and then just dancing on this canvas for like an hour while jonathan plays and it was just like yeah <laughs> That, that was a that was a, a core memory for me that that whole thing was just wonderful were you playing were you improv yeah or? that was a full okay. improv set um so my friend uh lewis achenbach uh he's one of the painters at fulton street he has a studio there he also runs this series he calls the jazz occurrence and he had asked me to 
come in for one of like he has live he has painters come in like who want to do live painting while music is happening very often it's a lot of jazz musicians who also come into fulton street like it's a big jazz venue and i'm kind of like this offshoot of it is improvisation and so there is in a way a form of jazz but not the jazz that you generally expect to hear um but yeah, Lewis has come to my shows before and we became friends and he, I, I've done improv for him before with live painting. And he's like, can you come in for this set? And there's going to be like 20 something artists just doing their thing. And I'm like, absolutely. I love these things. Sign me up. And so that was a, it was a wonderful experience. And then I was like, oh, there's going to be a dancer there, uh, like a photographer, all sorts of like artists doing like their respective like art forms and like reacting to my music. But it was a fully improv set, fully improvised set, which was super fun for me. I love doing that. So then, yeah, so you have the ballet dancer who's painting while she dances. But then you also had these stations, like you said, like, you know, 10 to 15 to 20 artists just having an easel in front of them doing their thing. Where I was, I had someone doing charcoal um, art and people are just doing different things and then afterwards we got to walk around to see just the diversity of how this performance inspired so many different ways i was so excited to see that it was very eclectic there was like no artist that was like the same it was everyone's so unique it's very beautiful and then this previous one that was last week at constellation it was you guys merged as flannel. Yes, the flannel. Wearing I do. flannel shirts. <laughs> and uh, I came with a friend from New York, and I'm like, just get ready. There's going to be some, some interesting stuff. <laughs> You're from New York. You'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's, that's a little true. <laughs> Slightly, but I'm sure she was like, what? That was cool. I love, I love stuff like that. Thank you. Yeah, that that's a new project that's uh that me my my friend Kyle Flens, who's a percussionist in the city and plays with Ensemble Del Niente, um, him and I have become very good friends over the cor- few course of the years, and we we're like, what if we did a concert, you and I, because we like playing music together, um, we 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 share the same like we enjoy the same kind of playing, et cetera, et cetera. So let's just do this. It's going to be, it's not that it won't be easy to play, but it's like, it's easy to play with you. As a collaborator, he's great to play with. Things are very clear when we're playing together. And I love that. So we decided to just do this project. And uh, yeah, that was like our debut concert. Because we've done a few like shows in the past for like festivals and things. But we're like, let's actually turn it into a duo and come up with a real silly name. (laughs) Flano. Flano uh and then wear flannels <laughs> and we're gonna regret that i'm sure in the summer when we do a show <laughs> we haven't like thought about when that show will happen yet but i know that i'm gonna be sad when i'm in flannel and playing in like 90 degree weather <laughs> so when you have you go into these different spaces you have the uh fulton mm-hmm. art collective and then you have constellation when you when you arrive and you're setting up like how different are these pianos that you're playing like you practice on this one mm-hmm. but like you can't haul this no. instrument around so how do you what goes through your mind when you get there to set it up how you like it best right I, I, that's a great question um that's a that is the reality that every pianist faces so like anybody that you talk with who's like what i would cons- like any pianist who's like in the gig economy or like is like working as a professional knows this question or like thinks about this is like what do i do yeah Um, we're all trained or we're all taught like as we're like practicing and stuff to be able to just play on anything it's like you don't know what you're going to get and so you have to be prepared to acclimate as fast as possible um so when my te- when I was in school, my teacher, her big thing was there were some big takeaways that I think I just like keep to my practice is like the piano is your friend, which I know is like kind of silly to say, but like every piano is very much like a living being to me that like I am fostering a relationship with. And how I when I like touch the key, 
or like when I like play something on it, the the way that the piano itself plays as I am trying to get my ideas in my head across, that's where I start to like find that relationship. Like, are we going to be, is it going to be a hard relationship? Is it going to be very easy? You're always praying for like, it's easy and we're all going to be great and that we're going to be able to do the things we want to do more times. It's like a compromise we could say. Um, so like by compromise, it's like sometimes the piano will not be able to do certain sounds or do like articulations or, uh, attacks that you may want to do just because of the instrument itself. Like every instrument has its own personality and like weight of the keys is different. Like if you play the key on this piano, it's going to feel different to the piano that you play at another space. Sometimes, like depending on the the age of the piano, it can be very um, <clears throat> it can be very different because if it's an older piano, it may have a tinnier sound, for example. Uh, so the action may just be slightly different because of its age. Uh, if a if it's a like a spin it upright, those can have very very light actions, but also not feel that great because sometimes you want a little bit of weight in the keys. So it's like every single piano is like when I press a chord, I'm like. I know what it's going to do, or I can start to imagine how it's going to react to how I'm going to play. So when that happens, I can start to acclimate my playing to being like, okay, these are the tempi that I'll be able to accomplish safely. It's like the, this piano is too heavy, not this piano, but like if I'm playing on a piano, it's like this piano is too heavy. So I'm only going to be able to do certain things on it and other things are going to be more effort. So I'll have to prepare for more work. Um, the pianos at all these venues are always like very lovely and I enjoy playing on them. Uh, but Fulton is definitely different to Constellation. Like I can like those two pianos that they have there that I have both played on are very, very different types of, uh, I mean, the models are different. I can't remember exactly at the top of my head, but just the models themselves can be like totally different approaches to like how I'm going to press the keys, get the sounds I want and, and think about how to approach performing it comfortably because again it is like you're trying to create a relationship with it if you're fighting it that's where that dis that's where things can go wrong you never want it to be adversarial yeah you're always viewing it as a friend just like in life we all have different friends <laughs> who have different personalities exactly. and variables <laughs> yeah yeah, that, yeah exactly and it's like sometimes you're gonna have like a it could be, we'll say, like a really, uh, uh, like so that friend that's just like, I need you to, I need space away from you. <laughs> <laughs> just every now and then. <laughs> um, and like those kind of pianos are, I, there are pianos that I'm like, I hate playing on them. Like they are just a pain. They just, they don't speak well or they have just problems with them or there's something in the attack or there's something in its sound overall that I'm just like, I'm not going to jive with. But I have to play on it. So I'm going to do the best I can and make sure that the audience still hears what it needs to hear because that's how we're taught. So how, how much time do you give yourself at a performance showing up to a venue and figuring out mm. all this you're saying? Um, how long does that usually take you? Not too long. Yeah. I probably, I probably know everything I need to know to play on a piano in like 30 seconds. <laughs> Like I'll be like, like I'll, normally I, I have like one piece that I play. I play this little Bach prelude that I enjoy warming up with. And then like I play a scale and I'll play a few chords and like that's probably all I'll need to just be like, all right, this is going to be a great time or a real rough time. <laughs> Could you do that right now for us? Um, my, my little warm up? Sure. Yeah. <laughs>
Nice. Yeah. Way to way to make me warm up. <laughs> it feels it. It's almost like um, your body changed in a way. Mm. Like, like you're just now like more alert or more <laughs> like you have more energy. I woke up. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh my god, play piano. Especially that Bach piece. There's like this like. <laughs> really wicked little lick in the left hand that like i love to play but i'm always like sometimes it, it like because it's the only thing that i like have uh really i guess you could say like memorize but it's like i don't play it every day it's like this like little thing that i just enjoy doing every now and then it's a it's a bach prelude in g major from his first book from the well-tempered clavier and i really really just love playing that piece and i learned it over covid and then that became kind of like the it's a, since it's a little quicker it's like a, a faster piece it's a great way to like kind of test a piano and being like oh this will be easy to play fast on or this is going to be what do you what do you think of bach i i don't know if we've have we talked about bach before? maybe probably at the bar <laughs> um i actually have bach tattooed on my arm uh do you really? so yeah i have uh, i have his signature on my inner arm on my left arm huh. i'll show you later <laughs> like a lot of a lot of musicians uh i talk to who play piano um more more focused on piano so they they all like bach just comes up all the time um i well i love him enough to tattoo him on me but um i do actually i think bach is among my like top five favorite composers of all time um let alone just like in a way influences and in, like the the polyphonic approach that he takes like i love thinking in polyphony and bach was a master of that to me um what's, what's pro oh polyphony? polyphony it's polyphony so polyphony is when you have multiple voices going at once kind of like when you listen to a choir sing normally you have all these voices singing and they you, obviously the like, harmonies can happen from that but like it's mostly the practice of like multiple voices at once more flowing horizontally in space rather than like thinking harmonically and vertically because a lot of the time we think of just like harmony harmony and polyphony is more like you, you know you can like make more it's more of like this kind of flow to me rather than being like <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, yeah. Um, so I tend to think very pol polyphonically because I just love that personally from for my own practice, and that's kind of like how a lot of that was how I was trained in the end to kind of think. Uh, when I wasn't thinking about noise, I started thinking about melody, and like I just combine melodies all the time and make these larger sounds with that. Anyway. So that's that's polyphony when you have two or more voices going at once versus uh, homophony or homophonic textures is when you have chords or accompaniment normally in the left hand with a melody on top. That's homophony. And then monophony is uh, just a single line. So then Bach, was he like an innovator in that? or No, that was just the practice of the time period. Um, so like he was just like he's uh just another product of like what the the style and the preferred style of music was in germany 16 1690 well he was 1685 to 1750 and he that was just like how he was taught so like as a instrument as a musician and a composer he was like this is the thing you have to do because this is what we do um because he wrote he worked for the church and the church had a lot of treatises out that was like this is how we do it and so he learned from that style. And in a way, he was an innovator. Like, he did, like, he excelled on all of these styles of writing and this polyphony. But he was also just doing what the times called. So I always make my students learn Bach when I'm teaching them, um, especially if they're serious. Bach is, like, required in my studio because I feel like it makes you a better pianist. And maybe that's also, like, when you talk to a pianist, they start to bring up Bach because Bach is hard. It's not easy to play. It's like very obvious when you make mistakes, so you'll hear that. Um, but like, it's it's easy to it's hard to remember it because it's continuous music. It doesn't really cadence that often, and when it cadences, it goes into something else. 
it's just a thing that's like always flowing and then when the piece ends it ends so there's a lot of notes to remember there's a lot of harmony changes to remember and like the way he manipulates things gets very complex and if you learn the fugues uh from the well timber clavier he wrote a prelude and a fugue for each key those fugues are harder than the preludes themselves so i played the easy part of the prelude and fugue and then you have the fugue to worry about and those can result and that's like a, a big polyphony practice um, where you learn to highlight a specific melody within three to five voices going at once so you have to learn to like highlight and bring out things from textures that are very dense and fingerings can be difficult it's just a thing that's like always flowing and then when the piece ends it ends so there's a lot of notes to remember there's a lot of harmony changes to remember and like the way he manipulates things gets very complex and if you learn the fugues uh from the well timber clavier he wrote a prelude and a fugue for each key those fugues are harder than the preludes themselves so i played the easy part of the prelude and fugue and then you have the fugue to worry about and those can result and that's like a, a big polyphony practice um, where you learn to highlight a specific melody within three to five voices going at once so you have to learn to like highlight and bring out things from textures that are very dense and fingerings can be difficult like the technique can be difficult clarity so when you learn Bach you build your ear and you build your technique because it really requires you to be a steady and a good pianist to execute it well than any than anything else you normally can't hide behind the pedal which is what a lot of like younger pianists do is like i'm gonna hide all my mistakes with the pedal and bach normally is like you can't do that <laughs> you gotta be clear Dang. so, I, so I, it's I like I the standard it. yeah and it's a great and it is a great way to practice and like learn like it's um it's very uh pro technique and pro listening and the it's not like rhythms are necessarily complex and difficult but it's a great way to just really work on all the things that it makes a good well-rounded pianist i'd say nice now i noticed uh the last time we talked about this a little bit and that's your your john cage yeah, my 433. 433. I love my John Cage. No, I didn't see. I didn't know too much about John Cage the last time. Mm. But then um like a week or two later, I went to Miami and one of the books I brought with me, I bought in New York, but I decided I was going to read it on this trip was on the American avant-garde 1942 to 1962. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, but you'll get John Cage in that. <laughs> John John Cage uh man yeah, he's in there, and I'm like, oh, this this is who Jonathan was talking about. Oh, 433, that's what that meant. That's what he's talking about. Yeah, describe John Cage real quick. Yeah, John Cage was uh, an avant-garde, well, I guess you could say avant-garde, but he was, a, he was an American composer who I would say kind of rose more to popularity in the 1940s. Uh, he was particularly famous for one he's particularly famous for one piece that at least that's the one that you hear when you're in history classes 433 uh music of there's a lot of other stuff too but 433 is the one that like it's like almost a meme you can think of it <laughs> it's like john cage wrote this piece that literally is just silence and the whole thing is uh everything around you is music like you cannot actually hear silence in the world unless you put yourself in an anechoic chamber and then where you're completely devoid of any or all sound is completely dead uh you are always going to hear something and he is like kind of challenging us to be like the world is musical and like everything you hear around you can be music even if it sounds random there's actually there can be intent behind it if you choose to have it have intent i guess you could say uh, so like he's like here's f the first time it was performed by David Tudor I can't remember at the university now but like he played it and it was there's actually no time frame for this piece the only reason it became 433 was because David played it in four minutes and 33 seconds and then they just dubbed it that but theoretically the piece could go for hours if you really wanted to and that and so John Cage was a composer who kind of started challenging more of like how do we approach music it like is it really 
do we have to organize things in this way? Can silence now be music? Can we challenge noise to become music? Can we make random occurrences all of a sudden meaningful? Uh, and he used the I Ching. You probably read a little bit about that. Like he would compose music kind of based on these random uh, processes that he would create. He would like try to randomize things. And then he would write his pieces based off of like um, just he would like roll a dice or something. Like he'd do some kind of thing to like completely keep it out of his control and then write the music that way and then be like, here's a piece. I had no none of myself in this was the claim in a way you still have yourself because you are as you're writing that music you are in a way still making decisions on like where you want to place things and like how you want to approach that process but yeah he was a big one for being like why are we why are we serializing everything and doing all these things and making music more and more like complex and academic what if we just like anything goes kind of way a little more free philosophy and obviously buddhism really was important for him in that um so yeah i really like i mean like i love that approach he wrote some very beautiful pieces um and a lot of things that challenged others and actually just uh, i was at a constellation show a few weeks ago for a group called rhythm is image and they played a piece for four radios and it's literally an improvisation using four radios that you mic and you just kind of like you follow like the schematic of like the time frames but you normally just turn on a radio station and like whatever is on is on and you play it and so you have to like let that radio station sit there Wait, so you have the radio station, and then they're playing? No, they're, it's they're like all playing. four players have a, their own radio station, and like they all turn them on at the same time and just try to find a random station, and then they put that to the mic, and like that's what you're hearing, and like that's the music. So, and it changes. Like eventually, they'll be like thirty seconds in, find another radio station, or like turn off your radio, stuff like that. So he he did a lot of chance operations and really kind of took a different approach to like musical thought and ideology that i really love yeah it's like everybody's going this way but what about that way (laughs) and it it worked hand in hand um a lot with um with artists also like the avant-garde artists of like new york at the time and he influenced a lot of others like morton feldman like the there was like kind of a bigger new york conglomerate that like it was like john cage and feldman and oh what's his name course i'm like forgetting everybody but like frank o'hara who was the poet was there they collaborated and like rothko and um oh who's that one of my favorites and of course i'm like i'm blanking on the name great um but yeah there's there was a lot of different artists at that time in new york city who were not necessarily like following john cage's own ideology but they were all challenging that status quo all yeah. of a sudden like new york was its own like avant-garde like let's really and this is also post-war so like everything is a mess and like they're like we're restructuring society and rethinking culture and our relationships with that so it was very political in a way too like what they were doing and challenging is like w- let's build something new yeah but yeah so cage is very important <laughs> For me, that's another one of my top five, probably. And he does have this one piece that it's called In a Landscape that's stunning. Uh, Just a little blip of it. like very very peaceful and honestly to me is like it was written in i believe 1945 and it's probably one of the pieces that people don't think about when they think of john cage and it's called in a landscape and he wrote another one called dream and they're very like ambient neo almost neoclassical style like what we have today like very meditative minimalist just these like really quiet repeating patterns and People are always like, they just think about like, bam, 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 smash, angry or disjointed. And it's like, there's a few things where just like, oh, he also is incredibly lyrical. He just chose not to do that. But yeah, I, I love those pieces because people are always like, I never expected John Cage to have written that. I was like, yeah, these are like my favorites. Huh. 
So who are who are the other? Th- you said five. What are who are the other three? You oh would God, I mean like that's like a rotating list. I'm like I guess like Cage and Bach tend to hit good for me. Um, who else? It is, it is a very big list. I say five because I think that's just <laughs> a good one. Uh, Rebecca Saunders was very very important for me. German uh, composer who's still alive today who has a huge focus on sound. Um, I played a, one of her piece called shadow years ago and it's beautiful and uses a lot of like this kind of quiet, well, not, it's a very aggressive piece, but uses, a the middle pedal of the piano, which is called the sostenuto pedal and the sostenuto pedal can hold chords for you or silently hold chords for you while you play other stuff. And then eventually those chords that you don't play will ring out from just the natural, the sympathetic vibrations inside the piano. This piano can't, I can show you that I can't, this pedal doesn't work that way, but I can put that here. So it's like, I I call it like ghost chords, but it's just as a fun way to explain it to people. Okay. But yeah, it's, it creates this idea of, um, you can bring out a, like a C set, you can bring out a C major chord by not ever having to play the chord, you can just do other stuff, and eventually that chord comes out. Isn't that cool? Nice. <laughs> I love that. There's like so many things you can do with this thing. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's why I got more into the avant-garde, or just like, I like the what brought me closer and more interested in the piano was doing weird things with it. Yeah. Because I got very. It wasn't that I got bored, but I was like, I was like in. I was in high school and I started, I learned about John Cage and then I listened to these pieces that he wrote and I was like, this is nuts. Like I've (laughs) never heard sounds like this before. And like, how can someone do that? And then I learned about like Ligeti and like composers like George Crumb, eventually like Rebecca Saunders, Haya Chernowin and like all these other like living composers or old avant artists who were really kind of like taking wild approaches to like what was possible on in, on any instrument really for that matter and like that broadened my horizons about what music could be but also just made me more intrigued about it and it was i didn't care if it was discordant or ugly sounding it was just more about like what how are you creating these sounds in the first place so i i do there's a piece that a friend wrote for me years ago that i'll actually be playing at cortona uh uh, in June, uh, that's it uses ebos, which are those electro electromagnetic uh, things for guitars. You can put them inside the piano. I'll show you. Um, but it's it's for ebos, um, credit card, uh, cloth, and uh, I have to mark something like twenty something harmonics inside the piano, and you can play natural harmonics from the strings. So. A really really wild piece but n- pretty much i don't use the keyboard all that much and it's great because I, I enjoy exploring what this instrument can do outside of our traditional use of it yeah and even I if i'm writing that. the traditional music like i write obvious like my minimalist albums are always on the keys like i still use techniques from time and time again to be like oh you like you'd like the sostenuto pedal it's like i'll do silent chords or i'll do weird things with the pedal or something to give a little extra personality beautiful so what what are you working on now what am i um there's a lot of moving putt pieces right now <laughs> but right now i am working on the repertoire so i'm going to the a festival called the cortona sessions for new music in cortona italy in june and I'm the resident this pianist. This is by Florence. This is by Florence, okay. yes. And uh, so I'll be participating in this festival. And I was like, I really want to go to Italy. This is a great, great way to do this. <laughs> so oh. I was like, so I got the, the, resident, the, the resident piano position. And so I will be performing with uh, other students and faculty there. And um, so I'm learning the repertoire for that right now. All of its chamber rep. Uh, and then I'm also going to perform uh, my friend Luis Fernando Amaya's piece, Condor Number no. 2, which was the one I was telling you about with the Ebos and stuff, and a few other solo pieces. Um, so that's what that festival will entail, and a few other odds and ends that I'm still figuring out. But like core stuff is the chamber works they assign me and this solo rep that I have to learn. And then I'm working on my newest uh, LP, 
based on the season of summer. I know last time we chatted, I had just finished a, a small EP uh, called Reminiscence, and that came out. And now I'm working on my next big full-length album. I am turning it into a, a collection of four full piano albums based on the season. So I had written Winter back in 2021 when I released that. And then I will be releasing... Um, I will be releasing this album probably in September, actually. Uh, I'm going to be recording it when I come back from Italy. I will be recording it in August, and it's going to be a real quick turnaround. But I have um, I have a audio engineer that I, that I love to work with that I'm very good friends with. And him and I did this the first time, and we're, we're going to do it again. We're going to record it in Gons Hall at Roosevelt University. So I get the oh, big, old, yeah. big old Steinway. But um, we're recording it in August. So I'm going to be learning. I'm still I'm learning the album right now while preparing for Cortona. So I'm like. So you've wrote it. Yeah, it's already And you're written. learning it to play. Yeah, because yeah. I write everything. At, I write everything now at the piano, but I generally will write it more from the composer lens where i'm like i'm just gonna do this and then future john can sweat about it later (laughs) and that's oftentimes very sad well not sad it's very uh i'm like why do i do this to myself because i write difficult music for myself to play then and then i have to learn it because i i was like if i can't play it then i'm like i'll figure it out later and then i learn it and go through the process of like learning a piece and then while I'm learning it, I make edits and do things like that so that I get to the final product. But yeah, I'm working on this album, uh, figuring out a, uh, we're going to do another release party like I did the first time, uh, likely at Space Again in Evanston. So just fingers crossed. And yeah, I'm very excited for that. So those are the big things is the Cortona Sessions uh, album that is going to come out in September. And probably my next solo show of more avant-garde stuff i'm gonna do another one of those i have i have some new repertoire that i've kind of accumulated recently and want to figure out how i can turn it into another more modern music concert yeah that's a lot you're gonna be pretty busy coming up here it's It's gonna be a lot or you are i'm dropping in on him like practicing preparing (laughs) yeah you heard me practicing earlier i was like i'm gonna get a little bit in before rich shows up and then I'm going to walk my dogs and then I'm going to continue practicing. <laughs> yeah. What do you, okay. So you're going to Italy, obviously this is, um, you know, something different than you're used to. How, so music is the focal point, obviously when you're there, are you going to, take kind of the experience around it and use that stimuli and new information and images to incorporate into your music moving forward you think i hope so (laughs) i generally get influenced a lot from it's probably not a very linear thing it's probably just all kind of yeah if it's there and i think about it eventually something will come out of it i guess you could say um while i'm there i mean the the festival has a lot of other things like i get to like the food culture is obviously like first and foremost important for me so i'll be doing a lot of that um i ate like two tubs of gelato <laughs> yeah over the weekend. i imagine i'm just gonna <laughs> i really like this uh gelato talenti mm-hmm. and their their uh their packaging they got this like twist lid that I, f- I just reuse so i justify i'm like i'm running low on i lost a couple of these and then i i put other food and stuff yeah yeah no totally yeah i chop up bananas and then freeze them and use them for my like protein smoothies it's amazing so the more the more talenti you get then the more the more i can stock up on there you go. Bananas. <laughs> it's a win-win situation exactly <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm always like kind of influenced from my environment and my surroundings. A lot of my music, I think, is very focused on imagery, first and foremost these days. Imagery and or poetry, like, but not 
I not I can't think of it like anything else at the moment. It's like I look at a painting and I'm like I will write a piece on that, or like I I see like a mountain and it's like I will write multiple pieces on mountains, or like I like liminal spaces and I follow a lot a bunch of them on Instagram and I'm like I love how creepy that is. I'm gonna write like five pieces on that and like what's, it, what's a liminal space? A liminal space is like it's like a what's I, I don't remember the exact definition. It's like they're kind of there's a there's a weird offshoot of uh how do i put it it's like a a, it feels like a memory like a like you feel like let's say you like look at like a a abandoned chuck e cheese and it's like you feel like you've been there but most of the it's like kind of surrealist horror or like psychological horror where there's like Mm, you look look at this picture and it's something's off about it and you're like i've seen this in a dream or you feel like was i there or was this a dream and like the 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 line is very blurry as to like is this like th- picture that I'm looking at like something that I have actually been in before, and they tend to be very much focused on like '90s like photographs or like early 2000s oh, photographs, where it, like you know like our childhood is like you look at like a certain picture and you're like it's like kind of like I remember that, but our memories obviously like shift and work through as we get older, so. I think liminal spaces kind of plays with this idea of like you look at a picture, but you're not quite sure if that picture was real or like yeah. that experience was real. And like your memory just kind of contorted it at some point or like you're thinking of it from a different lens. Hildy, no. Sorry, my dog won't chime in. She's like, I agree. Um, but yeah, so liminal spaces tend to be on like kind of like a psychological horror kick with them. And I really enjoy that personally i saw some dolly i went to the dolly exhibit oh nice last week yeah that's kind of similar right yeah it's kind of very, yeah this weird kind of... surreal and i love i've always loved surrealism so dolly yeah. um magritte like those kind of juan miro like those painters are very important for me growing up because i just enjoyed looking at them and i enjoyed how weird it was and i was like i like weird <laughs> and i just never got i never grew out of it the older I got, the like the weirder I get. And I'm like, I like this weird thing. I like that weird. Thing. Like I want something like twisted. And I, I just, it's just cur- It's curiosity. Like I had, I get, like I have nightmares sometimes about like these strange places and like are like a weird thing. And it's like I'll enjoy my nightmare. I'm like, this is so twisted. I love it. And then I wake up and I'm like, I'm glad I'm awake now. <laughs> Well, uh, why don't we, to wrap this up, would you be able to play some stuff for us? Yeah, sure. I'll uh, make up for the Bach. <laughs> no, the Bach was good. Here, I'll hold but here, I'll, I'll play you it. actually, yeah. um, I'll play you from my whatever, new whatever album. Whatever you want. I'll play you a piece from my new album. Yeah, beautiful. Um, it's called, uh, it's actually a very simple title, but it's called Prelude. And it's the it's the start of this summer, this summer album. And when we think of summer, where is this album? When we think of summer, obviously, I think like laziness and or like like a little bit more of a laid back feel, right? Yeah. So I can play you two pieces if you'd like. Yeah, let's um, do it. So the first piece is called Prelude, and it's very energetic, very bright, very like okay. summer. <laughs> like I've, it's like the start of summer is like life comes back, everyone's excited to just kind of like be outside again, and it's like the world is alive. And then I'll play actually. I'll play the last movement of this album and it's called, what did I call it? I believe I just called it Nightfall. And that one's like a way more of like a relaxed, very humid l- late evening. Love it. So I'll, I'll do the the extremes of this. So here's Prelude. I do, wait, oh, before yeah. you begin, mm-hmm. I was curious about this uh, at Constellation. Yeah. Right here, this device. So you, you're, you're playing composed notes, right? Yeah. You're playing... What what is that called? Uh, oh, the score. Score. Yeah. So you're playing the score, uh-huh. and you've created this score, right? You, yeah. This piece I hear I wrote. So you wrote this. Now, what device are you using? What is that? Oh, so this is an app called Fourscore. F O R S C O R E. It's actually it's a great app that musicians will often use to like organize their music. I have a eight and a half by eleven iPad, so it's like reading a regular score. And I have a actually a Bluetooth pedal tuner, uh, pedal or page turner. That's the word, page turner. So when I press the, it connects to my iPad. The app syncs up with that, and I can press the button, and it just turns the page for me. So I don't need a page turner. 
Yeah, my friend and I were talking about that. Like trying to figure out how I was doing it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. It's this thing right here. And I just keep it to my left. Yep. And so I just hit it and it turns the page for me. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So that that's how that works. Fun fact. <laughs> and here's what I'll do. Uh, we'll have the microphones here, but typically what I like to do, how I enjoy Jonathan's music is I just either I'm writing. So I'll be at my computer like typing and actually writing like fiction or, or whatever. Or, and so like reminisce is in the background. Um, it's beautiful. Or I'll be kind of winding down my night and I'll like have a candle on and just write in my notebook and Jonathan's music is in the background. But then in the shows, I just have my notebook and I just write like <laughs> whatever, whatever thought comes to my head, I just write it down and I just keep going and going. And, uh, so I'm always excited to attend Jonathan's performances. Cause it's just like, Oh, I'm gonna go to town it's on this notebook. Different. It's something different. And it just, it, it, uh, tickles different parts of my brain. <laughs> yeah. This is a, I finally, I finally found a way to, I, I slightly, I guess like I pigeonholed my, my current kind of musical writing, I've <laughs> in my brain I'm like it's just math rock minimalism. <laughs> math rock minimalism. Stick math rock minimalism. You'll see. I'm gonna play this. Yeah. So yeah.
Thanks for playing that for us. Yeah, no problem. Happy to share. It's good for me to practice them too. <laughs> so I am going to have to record these. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> uh, it's great. That first right? one is like so much fun to play. That one's not as relaxing, but it's just really fun to play. It's just like nourishes the soul. Aww, I feel like. Thank you. It's just like... well, there's a whole album of that coming. I love Get it. Ready. I love it. And uh, one last note. I love your dark red shirt. Thank you. I love your dark red shirt. Great, Great individuals <laughs> in the world wear dark red. That's right. Is it actually is like one of my favorite colors to wear. So. Yeah, it looks good. It's a good color. It looks good. Well, Jonathan, thanks again for coming on. Thank love you for it. having me, Rich. This was a pleasure as always. We gotta do this when you come back from yes, from uh, we, Italy. Yes, we'll do another one of these and I'll another have great chat. Plenty of stories, I'm sure. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right, thank you again.